Thank you, Catherine, for joining us today. It's a delight to have you here at Blackwells and to talk to you about reading and books. When you were young, what books were precious to you and opened your imagination to the world of reading? So, there were so many, and I think there will be for anyone who's now ended up a children's writer, but there were a few that just got under my skin and that I read, I think, literally hundreds of times. And one of them was a book called Charmed Life by Diana Wynne-Jones, who is, I think, still the best writer of magic for children in the world. And it's a little bit like Harry Potter, but it's more sarcastic and it's slightly funnier, sharper, and it has just this feeling for it. When you read it, it feels a little bit like you've discovered another home. And I think that's what a really great book does. You grew up in Zimbabwe and then moved to Belgium when you were a teenager. How has growing up in different cultures influenced the writing and the stories you tell? I think growing up in Zim especially gave me a sense of the natural world as this extraordinary thing that you could, you could explore, but also as this extraordinary thing that we ourselves as a human race are not very gloriously ruining. And so a lot of my books are about um, children discovering beauty and discovering wildness, sometimes in very obvious places like the middle of the Amazon jungle where you'd expect it, and sometimes in places where you wouldn't, like the rooftop of a Parisian building. You started your children's fiction career with Girl Savage, which was published in 2011. Was it always a dream to become an award-winning children's writer? And do you remember the first time you saw Girl Savage in a bookshop? I, I always wanted to be a writer, ever since I was five or six, ever since I realised that books don't arise organically like apples or grass. And then I wasn't sure I wanted to be a children's writer, I think, when I was young. I didn't have a sense clearly of what I would do, just that it would involve language in some way. And then I remember wanting to write for children, in part because I felt very young myself, I was only just turned 21, but in part because I wanted to be able to offer kids a new landscape, and that's what you can do with every book. And I do remember seeing The Girl Savage, it was in... Um, the Waterstones in Piccadilly and it's one of those things you desperately want to pull it out and autograph it but you'll think that they might just think you're graffitiing the, the stock so I didn't. Your second novel Rooftoppers was received to great acclaim. Could you please give us a 20 second summary of what the book is about? So Rooftoppers is about a girl who's found floating in a cello case in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean after a shipwreck and a man who was also on the ship rescues her and brings her up but she remains convinced that her mother is still alive and various things happen so they have to run away from London and they go to Paris and there she discovers a gang of children who live up on the rooftops of Paris and they shoot pigeons with bows and arrows and they use the trains for loos and they leap from building to building and they help her go mother hunting. As you said in the book, Sophie, the main character, is looking for her mother in Paris. She believes her mother is a cello player and that she can hear the music while she's on the rooftops. How important is music to you and your writing? Do you listen to music as you write? And if you do, does the style of music reflect to the story you're trying to create at that time? I do listen to music and it, you do try to find the music that will push the right kind of style, that will summon a kind of mood. But sometimes, uh, so that might be jazz or it might be classical, I can't listen to anything with lyrics. But then also sometimes that itself is too intrusive. So then I have an app on my phone which produces um, coffee shop noise, like a sort of burble, just to have some sense of sound that I find the opposite of distracting. I find it pushes me away from the world and into the imagination. You wrote the novel whilst you were living here at All Souls College in Oxford and you actually explored the rooftops like your characters do in The Rooftoppers. Um, did you ever get in trouble for exploring somewhere you shouldn't have been? And did you go up on the roofs before or after you decided that would feature in your book? So the roof climbing predates roof toppers by several years because I started climbing buildings um, when I was an undergrad here at Oxford. Um, I have never been caught. I've never been in trouble. I've climbed um, a few things which, when you get to the top of them, the view makes it worth the terror. So things like the towers on Battersea Power Station or Centrepoint, which is a skyscraper in the centre of London. And those you climb, I climb very slowly, very carefully. 
And it's because when you get up, you see the world from a different vantage point. And that's what Rooftop is about, about seeing the world from above, about seeing the world and not being seen, and also about you know, finding a different kind of world. One of the things that I loved about the Wolf Wilder was the real sense of place and setting. You could really feel like you were in the coldest part of Russia and you were living in this society that had wolves and they were treating them as entertainment and then having to release them into the wild and be taken to people like Theo and her mother. When you are writing your novels, do you spend time researching the real life locations to help create the description of the worlds in your stories? I do. So I am an academic by training and a nerd by inclination. So it's always going to be my instinct to research, to find books and documentaries and images and archives. But then I've also been to everywhere that features in my book. So some of my family is from Russia, so we used to spend time at St. Petersburg. And it was there, we used to go in the winter, and the snow would come up to your thighs. And we went wading through the snow to pick a Christmas tree to cut down. And that kind of feeling that the world was blanketed and transformed. That's what I wanted to capture in the Wolf Wilder. If you could travel anywhere with no limitations to research your next novel, where would you choose to go? Um, the moon, uh, outer space. I, I long to see the world from above. When I was about eight or nine, I've always wanted to be a writer, but there were other things that would filter in, like I wanted to be an acrobat or an architect, and then I desperately wanted to be an astronaut. The wolves are obviously a very important part of the wolf wilder and the relationship they have with trust and love with Theo. Do you own any pets yourself? I don't. Because I live mostly in London, but sometimes in Oxford, I feel that any dog I had would be dead on the floor in three days. But when we were little, we had these beautiful mongrels um, in Zimbabwe, and they certainly informed a little bit the wolves and the wolf wilder. And one day, one day, I hope to have a dog. Congratulations for being a Costa Book Award winner for your latest book, The Explorer. It's a fantastic adventure story from beginning to end and truly deserves the recognition it's receiving so far. For those who are watching and don't know anything about this story, please can you explain to us in bullet points what the book is about? The Explorer is about four children who are in a tiny little aeroplane flying towards Manaus to go home to London and it crashes and so only the four children survive and at first they do traditional survival book things so they eat grub paste and they build a raft and then they discover a map and the map leads them down the river past wild pink river dolphins to a ruined ancient city and in it there's a man and he won't tell them his name so they just call him the explorer and he has a secret and the second half of the book is them discovering his secrets. What made you choose to set the novel in the period of time that you decided to? So it's set in the sort of, it's never actually pinned down, but you could work it out if you really wanted to. There is a way to work it out. But um, it references Percy Fawcett, who was the explorer who was searching for the lost city of Zed, who disappeared in the 1920s and no one ever heard from him again. And so it needed to be set in a kind of time where that kind of exploring was still happening. But I wanted to make very sure it didn't, smell of empire, that it didn't read like I slept in a pith helmet. I wanted to make sure that it was clear that that kind of exploring brought a great deal of destruction in its wake and it's about discovering another way to see the world without destroying it. One of the themes that features quite often in your books is this sense of friendship and solidarity. In The Explorer, you have Fred and Khan and Lila and Max who are, you know, trying to survive in the Amazon rainforest. When creating your characters, do you, in the initial writing stages, spend a lot of time putting together their storylines and working out their relationships? I do. I, I try to do a very um, detailed plot that will show me where the characters can interact and I write it out. And then it's as if the plot and I never met. So um, I go wildly off piste. And so in fact, the plot is less useful as a plotting device and more useful as a way of thinking about the way the characters will spark against each other and hate each other and love each other. And you hope it'll go from there. 
Do you feel like you would be able to fend for yourself if you were in the jungle, lost like your characters? Well, I actually know the answer to this question because I went to the Amazon and I did a survival course with a really good friend. And it was just the two of us and a guide, a wonderful guide called Tarek. And he showed us how to find water from lianas, how to, we fished for piranha. One of the piranha bit the tip off his finger. He was completely unfazed. And then at the end of this course, we said, do you think we'd survive if you dropped us in the middle of the jungle? And he said, I'd give you three days and you'd be dead on the floor. So, um, no, I don't think I would. It's beautifully illustrated throughout by Hannah Horn. How closely do you work together in that process? And were the illustrations created once you had completed your manuscript? So I wrote the book first, and then we looked at various different illustrators. And Hannah had never done a children's book before, but I loved the colors that she used. And I think she has an exquisite line. So we sent her the manuscript. And then together, we worked through which scenes we should pull out, like. Um, where we should have some sloths, where we should have some tarantulas, where the dolphins should go. And then she went away and she was very much working alone and then later we would compare notes and I think she has created something quite spectacular. So final question, if you woke up one day and you had this magical power where you could erase the name off of any book by any author, which books would you choose? Gosh, um, I would really like to have written Hamlet. Um, I feel that there's a lot of credit to be gained there. Um, I think modern day authors who are still alive, whose work I think I rank most highly, would be in Adults, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, or something by um, Marian, uh, Marianne Robinson, who wrote Gilead, which I think is close to a perfect book. And then, if, I mean, it would be mean to Philip Pullman, who is a great hero of mine to remove his name off the books, but I probably would if I could. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been such an honour to interview you today and I really look forward to reading your future work. Thank you so much for having me.